Welcome to KCPS Homeroom. I'm Paul Turner, Social Studies Coordinator for Secondary Level. Today, we're going to talk to you about the Gilded Age. We're going to finish up some of the questions that we have for the Industrial Age. We're going to cover questions about labor and how that come about. So today, you're going to need pencil and paper and be ready to learn. Today's objective, we're going to explain the socioeconomic change and continuities associated with the growth of industrial capitalism from 1865 to 1898. Remember the Gilded Age, what did Mark Twain say? It was basically a shining era underlined by corruption and basically greed. So when we talk about the Gilded Age, we have to talk about the workers, right? The workers in this was a diverse working people, right? We had women working, we had kids working, we had men working. So the workers were diverse, right? So all of them had different needs and different goals. We had kids working 16-hour days alongside their parents, right? So basically what was happening to the educational system, what's happened to these kids basically just mentally. All right. So, while we talk about the workers, we have to talk about the battle of wages. You remember industrialists, they wanted to capitalize on their profit. They put all this money towards building these basically these huge, these huge factories, right? And they wanted to capitalize on every piece of money that they got coming in. So they were paying these workers low wages. And even if they complain, guess what? We're going through a huge immigration phase. So they could pay these immigrants a whole lot less than what they could pay some of these workers. So some of these workers just didn't complain at all. And they're dealing with unsafe working conditions. Literally, sometimes you can have somebody's hand get cut off and they still have to work. So what do we do there? There's no real safety net going on in American society. So labor's greatest strength was a strike. So if I'm living in these, working in these factories, basically these long hours, these horrible conditions, only thing I really can do is strike. Most strikes were ineffective. That's going to be a common theme throughout this basic lesson. These strikes were ineffective, right? The American public basically turned against these striking workers. And these industrial capitalists, what they would do, they hire these called strike breakers, right? They would break up these riots. Basically, some, sometimes when these strike breakers would come in, they would line up against basically these workers. While these workers would send their, you know, more, more money for more job, right? More money for more pay, all that good stuff. These strike breakers would come in with guns and weapons and basically becomes a powder keg. Boom, it just blew up. So I want you to think about sometimes like this summer, what happened basically in some of these major cities. Sometimes a powder keg just happens and things just blow up. So that was happening in American society during this time frame. All right, the power of the federal government will come in, too, during these strikes, right? So, let's talk about some of these strikes. Uh, basically, let's talk about 1866. Rutherford B. Hayes was the president during this time frame. He basically brought the power of the federal government to basically end the strikes. They were bringing troops basically to quell strikes. They used court orders to quell strikes. So, if these workers were striking, the court would rule against them, basically forcing these workers to go back to work for low wages. And the National Guard, again, they were part of the powder keg. So a lot of the times you saw the use of the federal government using all the powers against these workers. They were trying to fight for safe working conditions, shorter working hours, but again, the federal government and these industrialists were against them. So, use of big business, what they would do. Basically, some bites are complaining about work-ins, you know, unionizing and all this good other stuff. They would use this lockout system. So what lockouts did, basically this process of locking workers out of work. So literally, they would lock the doors to not allow these workers to come in. This basically was a huge shift. You know, you start taking some people's money away, put it like this, people get more in line. And they used to scab work. And basically what a scab is, is basically bringing in replacement workers to take your job. So literally, you can be out there striking, and the scab will come in, basically start doing your job, and basically he becomes a full-time worker in your place. And sometimes they become the permanent worker in your place, too. So, another tactic that big business would use is called this yellow dog contract. And what this yellow dog contract was, basically, it forces workers not to unionize. Basically, you would sign this contract. And this contract will force you to basically become part of this union, part of this company. They said if you sign on to become part of this company, basically, if you unionize, I can fire you. And a lot of times these workers become blacklisted, basically, in the city. So a lot of times these workers would come in, basically, you know, they realize they work in these horrible conditions. So they decided they want to become this part of this collective, this union, basically to fight for these workers' rights, basically fight for more pay. 
So a lot of times these companies say you sign this yellow dot contract, you can't unionize. So if you unionize, I'm going to tell all these other businesses around you not to even hire you if I fire you, right? So a lot of times these basic workers will basically bond and basically to these, uh, to these factories. They couldn't go find other jobs other places. They'd be literally become blacklisted in the city. So they couldn't find jobs anywhere. Their families were struggling. And if I fire you, more likely, if your brother's working there too, guess what I'm going to do to him? I'm going to fire him. So now you have pressure on you, right? You can't unionize. If you unionize, I'm going to fire your whole family. I'm going to put that pressure on you make sure that you don't try to basically take money out of my pocket if I'm an industrialist. Okay, now let's check. What did big business do in the late 1800s to force workers from unionizing? Remember, we just talked about it, right? We talked about blacklisting workers. We talked about yellow dog uh, contracts. We talked about using the federal government against them. All right. How do workers fight for their rights during the workplace? They try to strike. They try to fight, fight for basically their needs for more worker, for more basically pay, for more, uh, <laughs> for more uh, basically safe, safety, uh, safety in the workplace. These are all tenets of basically social reform that we're going to start bringing up here in the next few weeks. So, the middle class response basically to workers. The middle class basically, they didn't support striking workers. You have to understand that in American society we're competing for basically limited resources. So the middle class saw these striking workers basically trying to take some of their goods from them, take some of their competition, some of their resources away. So they felt like these you know, these striking workers were radicals. They felt like these striking workers were basically trying to take resources away from this middle class. And you remember, if I'm part of that middle class, I'm trying to get to part of that upper class too. So, politically, I'm identifying with the upper class because I'm envious of them, right? They felt, again, they felt like these workers were radicals. You hear this all the time, especially in the age of politics today. The term radical, you know, basically want to overthrow the government. You hear about the term anarchist. That's what they were thinking about these striking workers. They're basically using the term socialist before it was being used. All right, so it all comes to a head, right? 1877. These railroad, you know, bearers of uh, these bearers of of industry, they felt like they was this. They were bold and right. They knew that they had the power of the federal government behind them. They knew it. So. They basically cut the workers' pay by 10% in 1877. This was huge. Take 10% of my money away from me. That's a lot of money taken away out of my pocket, right? So they cut the wages by 10%. This led to a strike. The Great Railroad Strike of 1877. This forced the government basically to come in with a strong hand and basically quell this strike. Rutherford B. Hayes, he sent federal troops to stop this strike. It was a massive, massive strike. He sent over 100 troops in, right? Basically with their guns, with their artillery. So guess what happens? That powder keg went off. Bam! When that powder keg went off, basically things happened. You saw people basically die in the streets. These workers basically were forced to go back to work. And basically, you started seeing these workers saying, you know what? Who do we have on our side? Who's, who do we have fighting for us? So you start seeing this term called unionizing, right? So industrialists, government opposed them, basically workers striking, right? Most strikes were ineffective. Competing interests based on race and class basically were forcing these workers apart. So you start seeing this term called unionizing coming about, right? The first unions basically, they're, for, uh, they're basically for white males during this time frame. They didn't want basically minorities a part of them. They didn't want immigrants a part of them. They're basically for Protestant white males who have already been here, right? So, when these unions started coming about, they basically excluded the Irish, they excluded the Asians, they excluded blacks, they excluded women. Most of these unions basically were protecting, again, Protestant white males who's been here, been here for a long time. So, let's start answering some questions. How did the federal government respond to labor strikes? You remember, they used court orders, they used basically the uh, troops, and they used other tactics basically to force workers to go back to work. What were some of the competing interests of labor and class basically against big businesses? So, again, I would bring in immigrant workers to take your spot. I'd bring in scab workers to take your spot, right? So that's how big businesses quell these strikes. 
I want you to explain some continuities of labors during this time frame. Some of the continuities of labor. Remember, labor tend to basically, if I work the same job as my brother, I'm bringing him in basically my family, right? So, that was still one of those interests. Tend to labor tended to be a family thing. Even when the Irish and even when the Italians started coming over, it was a family thing. If my family got a job somewhere, more than likely I'm going to get my brother hired, I'm going to get my cousin hired, I'm going to get my wife hired. We're all going to work in the same factory during this time frame. All right, now that you do, guys. I want you guys to write one paragraph on how labor should respond going forward with big business. You should be able to explain your thoughts if labor should continue about what was happening in the past. Basically, should they continue what was happening or should they find a new way going forward? You should explain your thoughts on paper and basically it takes about one paragraph to do that. I want you to think about what's happening during this time frame. Remember, this is a changing world. Mark Twain basically defined this era as the Gilded Age. Remember, it's an era of wealth defined by corruption and basically an underbelly of basically of wealth being exceeded while we're leaving people behind, correct? So this Gilded Age was huge going forward. Labor had a huge response going forward too. We'll talk about that next week. I'm Paul Turner, Social Studies Coordinator, Kansas City Public Schools. See you guys from Homeroom. Bye.